Right, let's now have a look at what embedded systems are and go through their common characteristics. So an embedded system is a computer that can only perform a limited range of functions that is surrounded by a larger system. I've underlined the two key parts of this definition. We need to make sure if we're giving definitions, we include both of these two things. And there are loads of embedded systems in everyday life, often going under the radar. A classic example of an embedded system is a washing machine. So a washing machine is a large system. Most of this washing machine is not a computer, right? A lot of this is just a mechanical electronic system. Not all electronic devices are computers, but inside this washing machine, there'll be a tiny computer, which is really what the embedded system is. This computer only performs a limited range of functions relating to washing machines. You cannot use this computer to play games or send emails or watch YouTube videos because it's just not designed to do those functions. Now, why do lots of components have these systems embedded inside them? Well, adding a computer to your system means it's able to respond to user input. It's able to make decisions because it can run program code and it can also be left alone and can do things automatically. There can be code written, which tells it how to manage this system when the user isn't involved. So we add computers when we want to do some processing. Some systems don't need any processing. For example, a light switch doesn't need processing. A kettle doesn't need processing. A washing machine is complex enough that adding a computer would be helpful. So you could be asked in an exam to give some examples of the sort of things an embedded system is used for, which does involve you thinking on your feet a little bit. So for a washing machine, here are some possible tasks this embedded system will do. It will try and calculate the correct washing time. It might adjust that automatically based on how heavy your washing is. It will control how fast it turns. Again, it might adjust that if it detects your washing is getting quite dry. It might cut down how fast the drum is turning. If the water is getting too cold, it will adjust it using sensors to monitor this. And the computer will be overseeing this whole process. So it might detect some errors. It might detect some cloves stuck in the door. It might detect some lime scale building up. It can report that to the user. Now, all of these tasks are done with limited user involvement. All of these tasks would need to be done by a computer, which can carry out instructions. Now, there are clear differences between embedded systems and non-embedded systems. Non-embedded systems are the computers we would choose to use to do a wider range of tasks, things like laptops or smartphones. You do sometimes see people say that smartphones are embedded systems. Personally, I wouldn't say that. I just don't think a smartphone is an embedded system, although you will see that occasionally in textbooks or other resources. Now, this washing machine could have the same CPU as a laptop or a desktop computer, but it doesn't. It has this really simple computer because essentially embedded systems are smaller, they're cheaper because they only do a few different tasks and they're more specialized. So if you're doing a very specific task, you want very specific hardware, which only works on that task. It means it's more efficient than a general purpose CPU. Now those three bits in green are potential characteristics of embedded systems. But let me give you a few more typical ones because you could be asked about this in the exam. Now embedded systems tend to have the memory and the CPU on the same physical component. You might see this written as the same chip or the same circuit board. They are fused together on the same component, which helps keep it really compact. We'll look at ROM and RAM properly in a future video in case you're not fully aware of what these are. But in an embedded system, often there'll be more ROM than RAM or potentially no RAM at all, which is the opposite of what we have in a non-embedded system. Non-embedded systems typically have a much, much bigger RAM than they do ROM. They might do this because ROM is cheaper than RAM. It is slower than RAM, but that might not be a worry in your embedded system. We might also have more ROM than RAM because we are using ROM as our storage, which you would never ever do in a non-embedded system. You would never do this because ROM is read-only. So once ROM has been programmed, we can't then save more data to ROM, which in a laptop or a phone is useless because it means we can never save any of our work. But in a really specific embedded system, once it's been manufactured in a factory, we might not need to save any more data to it. Therefore, we can use ROM because it's cheaper than buying a separate secondary storage device. Some but not all embedded systems are real-time embedded systems. A real-time system will respond to you immediately with no delay. And the reason why it can do this is because it's sat doing nothing else. Its only purpose is to respond to you immediately. Whereas your laptop, it will often buffer or load while it's juggling other tasks. It won't respond to you immediately 
because it's not essential to do so. Whereas if it is, say, a medical situation, we may need our device to respond in real time. So this picture here is of a pacemaker. A pacemaker is embedded into the body and will help regulate your heartbeat. It is really important this pacemaker can detect an issue with your heart and then send out the pulse, which hopefully corrects this issue. If the CPU inside this pacemaker delayed a few clock cycles, that would be really dangerous because it could affect somebody's health. Whereas if your laptop delays a few clock cycles when you're watching YouTube, not as critical, therefore not as important to be real time. So pacemakers and washing machines are two good examples of embedded systems. Let me give you a few more because it's good to have a list in your head. Now a car has got loads and loads and loads. This picture here has all the different possible ones a car will have. Just to point out a couple of key ones, anything automatic will be handled by an embedded system. So if it turns on the windscreen wipers or the headlights based on sensors, that is a embedded system. Detecting collisions and deploying airbags will be handled by embedded systems as for any measures to avoid collisions, such as automatic braking or automatic swerving. And the sat nav itself will be an embedded system. There are loads of medicine, which are quite technical. So just to give you some general examples, anything which monitors your body, like a blood pressure sensor will be an embedded system. A defibrillator relating to the heart, again, would be an embedded system, as will be the computers which give you medicine or vitamins via um, injections. Those would be embedded systems. Planes have got loads, but are quite technical. So to give you a general one, all of us know about autopilot will be an embedded system. And within our homes, we've got potentially loads, especially if you've got expensive ovens or expensive microwaves or expensive toasters. If you have a cheap kettle or a cheap toaster, that is not an embedded system. So a safe way to make sure your examples are valid is sticking the word smart before the appliance to saying a smart oven or a smart toaster or a smart coffee machine that basically guarantees it is an embedded system. So here is a TV. You wouldn't just say TV, you would say smart TV. And a final example would be something like a cash machine, which is also an embedded system. So worth having a set list in your head like these examples so you have them ready to go, but don't be afraid to think on your feet a little bit. As long as it's doing something automatic, it will be an embedded system.